uh, as you can see, talk is how you Rubocop tweaks uh, the visitor pattern. I was hoping the pizza today was from Canadian pizza because I was going to make a joke about how you're getting two talks for one. But <laughs> it's a uh, domino, so <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, a little bit about me first. So I'm not actually uh, from a CS -like background. Uh, I started off as a business grad. And there's a little squiggly line there to kind of show that it's been a very interesting journey all the way up to uh, where I'm at Shopify right now. So yeah, interested to, to share, I guess, and talk about that if, if you want to, to find out more later. Um, so if you want to find me on Twitter, uh, like the webs, you can look for me at Wasabi Geek. Um, oddly enough, I'm probably not really a Wasabi Geek. Uh, I, can, I had to find out some facts because somebody <laughs> asked me uh, something once, but uh, I'm, yeah, I'll get better at that, I promise. <laughs> Uh, so moving on to the talk, um, it's mainly in these three, four parts. So firstly, I will talk a bit about what the visitor design pattern is. Then we'll talk about what Rubocop is. And then finally, like the meat of the talk which is like how Rubocop actually adapts the visitor pattern um, before we end off on like the trade-offs um, that we see um, from the visitor pattern. Moving on, what is the visitor design pattern? So it's a design pattern that separates the operation from the object structure. Okay, so you can see here that we have an object structure. Um, it's a graph uh, and has many types of nodes. You can see like there are three types of nodes here, A, B, and C. And the visitors sort of encapsulate uh, a set of logic for uh, like a set of operations, sorry, for the, for the different types of nodes. Um, when you see the example, I think it'll be a lot easier to understand. But first, we can't have a talk without a UML diagram, right? So <laughs> uh, I'm actually not very good with UML diagrams, so I think it's easier to, if we talk about uh, some example code. So I didn't come up with this. This is actually stolen from refactoring.guru, which I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, so for the visitor, pattern, there are like three main parts to it. The one on the right is like more or less our starting point. So that's the object structure. Just now you saw it as a graph um, with different kinds of node types. And in here you can see that there are two node types. There's a concrete component, concrete component B. Um, in the classical implementation, each of the concrete components need to implement this method called accept which will take a visitor. Uh, and then if you look over there, you see that the uh, component will call a corresponding method on the visitor. So in this case, for concrete component A, it's visitor.visit concrete component A. And you would see a similar thing for, for component B. Um, on the left side is the visitors. So uh, you can see that, for example, for visitor 1, it implements methods for each type of node. So there's, there's, visit component B, there's visit concrete component B, and so on and so forth. Um, the last piece of the puzzle here is at the bottom left, where um, the traversal actually happens. Here it's a very simple traversal. Um, I guess in the example, it's actually just an array. It's not like a very complex object structure. Um, but you can see that it's running through each of the components, and then it's calling accept with the visitor. Um, the traversal here is kind of simple, but it's also because like the classical implementation doesn't really uh, dictate a single way of doing traversal. Um, if you were to read like the Gang of Four like design patterns book, uh, it actually says like sometimes the traversal is encapsulated in the visitors themselves, right? Because maybe the visitor has a certain hierarchy that it needs to uh, match against before it, it uh, enables something. Or maybe the um, traversal is actually inside the component itself because they might be composite components. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's very simple there, but like there's, there's no actually um, there's no like one right way to do it in that sense. Okay, so let's move on to Rubocop. Um, just in case you're unfamiliar with what Rubocop is, it's a Ruby linter and formatter, which is a very fancy way of saying that. Uh, it checks your Ruby code against a set of rules. So we can see an example here that 
uh, it's in my VS Code. Um, so it, there's this cop here called layout, layout and alignment. Hopefully it's obvious what it's actually checking for against that because you can see the end at the bottom, which is highlighted with the squiggly, is not aligned with the def. Right? Excellent. Um, Bubocop also does formatting, so like it will be able to auto-correct in certain cases. Uh, but yeah. So the nice uh, the part um, that I want to like sort of stress is that Rubocop doesn't follow the classical implementation exactly, but the concerns are separated really similarly. So now we can move on to the meat of the talk, which is how Rubocop actually implements the uh, visitor pattern. So for Rubocop, the object structure is an abstract syntax tree. Um, I guess that's another way of just saying like it's a way of representing your code uh, as a tree, right? So let's again by example is that Cop actually uses this library called Rubocop AST, and you can see at the top there I have a string of code like private def method, and then I call the method. Uh, ignore whether the whether this will actually run properly for a while. Uh, yeah, formatters don't care about that, right? Inters don't care about that. Uh, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to have to walk back on that one, but you get why I, I think what I'm saying, right? Um, so ignore like whether that is like correct uh, code for a while, uh, and look at the bottom, which is where we actually run um, it, the AST uh, process source on it, and that generates AST. Um, it's a bit harder to see it like this, so I, I've taken the liberty of representing it as a tree, and uh, it's a tree, right? <laughs> um, hopefully it's a little bit like, I don't actually know fully how to like read it as if I was uh, a Ruby interpreter, right? But you can kind of see, like for example, after begin, there's send, right? And the first like uh, sub-element of send is nil. So it's kind of like sending to like, I guess the global kind of main function thing, right? And the second like, thing there, private, is the name of the method that's being called, followed by a subtree of uh, basically arguments to it. At least that's how I interpret it. So if you follow def down, you can see again the first is like defining sum, right? which is basically what we saw in the code there. And then um, it takes arguments to it, or like it defines arguments to it. And then it has the actual method definition, which is another send. And you can see there that for send, the second send, the first uh, uh, sub-element is not a nil, but it's actually a alva, which I think is local variable. So it's calling plus on the local variable with another local variable. So abstract syntax tree. Mm. Uh, the next piece of the puzzle for Rubocop is the visitor. So for Rubocop, these are called cops. Uh, and each cop is basically a linting rule. So we saw earlier def and alignment. And um, I, I, I actually put like a sort of summary of the code on the right side here. So for def and alignment, you can see that there are three main like uh, methods corresponding to nodes. Right? There's on def, there's on defs, and there's on send. Right? Uh, contrast this again with the classical implementation where it's called visit. Um, so quite straightforward, if you see, we'll very briefly talk about traversal next. Um, but basically what happens is as Rubocop traverses uh, the, the syntax tree, it's going to call the corresponding methods on all of the cops that are enabled. So for example, once we hit a def, it's going to call on def on, uh, this is the, on this cop as well as other cops. And Um, yes, execution and traversal. Uh, I'm going to try to explain this without uh, but confusing anybody, but it's a bit convoluted. It took me a while actually, and someone had to help me from <laughs> at work to understand the code. Um, but basically, most of the traversal happens in this class called commissioner, and maybe later we'll, we'll do a bit of spelunking to, to kind of show that. Um, there's this method called investigate. 
So if you look at the sequence diagram, I, I've only tried to show the traversal mechanism happening here, not the actual calling of the visitors. So in Commissioner, uh, there's some meta programming that happens at the once the class is uh, first required, right, that will define on node type methods. Uh, again, corresponding to all the different possible nodes in the syntax tree. And something happens similarly in this uh, module called traversal, which is actually included in Commissioner. Um, so you see already there's a bit of this interesting back and forth between the two, where we pass uh, a root node to uh, the traversal's walk method. And then the walk method actually calls the corresponding method on Commissioner to trigger all of the cops. And then it does a super <laughs> back to traversal with the root node. And then there's some traversal inside uh, the traversal module itself. And then we, uh, the process kind of repeats again with the child nodes and so on and so forth. So that's uh, kind of like what RuboCop does for traversal. So again, like if you think back to the classical implementation, you see a few things that are different. In a classical implementation, the visitor actually has methods for every single node type, right? Um, whereas in you saw in our dev and uh, visitor here, we actually only look for three node types. So all this like magic of like figuring out whether the uh, the cops actually correspond can on a certain type of node, it's actually happening inside these two classes. So that's a bit different from the visitor pattern itself. Cool. So, oh, I forgot I added this slide, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay, right. So, uh, there's one like sort of uh, caveat to this. Um, earlier I mentioned that sometimes the cops can do the, like the visitors can do their own traversal. And we actually, we see this happening in def n alignment. Uh, when I first saw the code, I was a bit surprised because like it's def n alignment, right? So it should only be looking for def nodes, right? So why is there an on send node, right? Uh, turns out that what this is doing is, uh, and that's why in the example code earlier, I had uh, private def. So on send is actually to handle this case uh, because private is, uh, is a send-like node. So what uh, RuboCop or what, what this cop does is actually it when it's on a send node it checks if it's a def modifier and then it will actually traverse it's uh, do an additional traversal. So fun fact, uh, yeah. Again, kind of showing like there's no clear line like that no right or wrong as to how traversals are implemented. Um, so now we'll talk a bit about trade off. Um, these are not like really specific to RuboCop in a sense. Like I think if you use the visitor, you kind of reap these benefits and trade-offs. Um, but this is a nice way of like kind of showcasing a real life example of how they work in practice. So for the first benefit, you see that each linting rule is actually uh, encapsulated in a cop, right? Which makes it very easy for us. And I'm sure most of you have done this where you can actually just turn off a cop or change one cop to only look for certain files without actually touching or like affecting any of the other cops. So because it uses like this sort of way of separation, uh, the encapsulation is great. <laughs> uh, the next one is it's very easy to add new operations by adding new cops in this case. Uh, again, uh, because the object structure and traversal logic is separate from the visitor, when you want to add like custom cops, you actually just create a cop without having to worry too much about how the object structure is like or how the traversal happens. Right? Uh, so these are like the two like main benefits that uh, come out to me. In terms of like the cost, right? So for the first cost, uh, there's actually a certain sort of coupling to the object structure. So you remember that each visitor needs to implement a method corresponding to a node type, right? Which means if your underlying object structure changes like how it like categorizes all the nodes, um, your visitor's assumptions will break, right? Uh, thankfully for Ruby, right? Because it doesn't change 
too much, like Python, right? <laughs> um, it does still happen. So I have this example here. I didn't actually break anything, but um, what happened is like the node that was generated when uh, pattern matching is used, it actually changed between, I think, Ruby 2.7 and 3. Um, so it can happen. It, it just doesn't happen often. But when it does happen, it means like it ripples through. It potentially ripples through a lot of visitors. Um, so that's a potential cost uh, that you need to be aware of when you use this pattern. Also things like, for example, ordering of nodes. If you remember earlier, the def end alignment, there's a very certain expectation that um, the on-send method was looking at. It's like, oh, it needs to be a send, and then after that, it needs to be a private, right? If the ordering changes, then of course, you'll break the traversal. Uh, another potential cost uh, is the reduced encapsulation of the object structure. So remember that. Um, Oh, I, didn't write, I didn't put this in the example, but if you remember from the classical implementation, uh, okay, I'll go back to there. If you, uh, from the classical implementation, you can see that there's this public method on the object structure, or a component of the object structure, and in the visitor, it's actually calling that public method. So you're actually having to expose more information uh, on your components itself. Um, and I didn't actually, I should have uh, added a slide for it, but oops. But in Rubocop, uh, like for def end alignment, you notice that it needs to know the starting positions. But actually inside the AST, there's no sense of that, right? All the spaces have been removed. Um, so actually every uh, node in the syntax tree um, actually records information about the location in the source code. So I think it's the method is called LOC. Um, and it's exposed for, for programs like Rubocop, right? But if, say, I was building like a Ruby interpreter, right? I actually don't need all this information. So you've kind of like lost some of the encapsulation of the object structure uh, because of uh, this pattern. So yeah, something to take note of. Uh, with that, you already saw the future. So, <laughs> uh, thanks. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Why? 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 Why this? Why? Why this talk? Is it right? Like, yeah. What got you interested in this? Why? Why right. this specific? This specific subject? Uh, I think for me, like I always had a bit of disconnect between like design patterns and actually using them, and I thought like. It'd be interesting to figure out if I can find a real world like sort of uh, parallel. I think especially for the visitor, when I first read it in like both like the the design patterns book and refactoring guru, I was like, uh, okay, great. <laughs> How is this actually useful to me, right? Uh, and I was thinking a, a bit, and I was like, oh, actually, it feels like Rubocop has a very similar sort of style. So that's kind of like how it went into here. I said two talks for the price of one, right? But actually, it's a lie because it helped me to scope down my talk a lot. <laughs> because I was actually trying to, I was actually thinking of whether to do like how Rubocop works, and then I like opened the source code. I'm like, nope, <laughs> it's not, it's not going to fit in a, in a small talk. Uh, but yeah, that's that's like the motivation. I, I do feel like, um, so I I do feel like there's a bit of a love hate relationship with things like design patterns, you know, people are like, oh, you, you know, don't just throw this pattern around here and there. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to like find my way around this and make sense of uh, all these patterns because I feel they're good, right? It's just more like you just need more examples of when they're used and why it's good or bad in those uh, circumstances. So, ta-da! Yeah. Um, there are other quite interesting uh, examples that are more close to the class implementation um, that are on my blog. <gasps> yeah, I got you with my mark. But uh, yeah, so there's this uh, library called Syntax Tree uh, by. So uh, it also like does like break down as a syntax tree, but it provides hooks for visitors to go in. And those hooks are very are implemented like more or less the classical way. So you see like each visitor really has like visit 
And you saw like earlier that there could be a lot of different kinds of nodes. Uh, I didn't count, I think it's probably at least 30 kinds of nodes. So you have a class that has like 30 like um, visit, <laughs> visit like methods uh, on that. So that's like a super classical implementation. Okay. Cool. Thank you for the question, by the way. Okay. Uh, if I understand it correctly, at every node, it goes into all the pods and then there is registered at point in time. Uh, yes, so I... I so just need to change that. Should it change? Uh, I can't remember exactly where that magic happens, but there's some error handling code. Uh, so I think it's around... Oh, my mouse there. Somewhere around here in the investigator that it will then call all of the cops and rescue if those methods don't exist on the cop. That sounds hugely expensive. Rubocop! <laughs> Ta-da! Well. Yeah. Caches on like um, the kind of whether it's the cops that he has visited before, mm -hmm. and you will cache it for the next run. So, that, so then that um, saves the execution for the next subsequent um, rule of code. Okay. Uh I'm gonna ask like a really new presenter question, but how do I use the same screen for? Command F1. Command F1. Wow. Oh, amazing. Wow. Wow, today I learned. Today I learned. <laughs> okay, so I thought it would be quite interesting to, if we had some time to do some to spelunking together. Um, so, if you remember, like, Rubocop, you call it in your command line, like, Rubocop, like something, right? Uh, usually, that's, like, defined in, like, the gem spec. So, here, for example, it says this is where your executables are. Um, so, if we go to EXE, you can see the Rubocop uh, executable. And... Uh, hopefully that's big enough. Uh, you can see that it goes to this CLI class, uh, basically. So in this CLI class, it calls, uh, so it eventually calls run here. So if we go to the CLI class and then we look at run, we see that it does this interesting dance. Uh, so let's ignore this for a while. Uh, and look at what seems like uh, the most correct <laughs> method, <laughs> which is execute runners. Um, oh, solar graph, not working. Okay, um, which is here. And then, uh, again, we didn't pass in any options, right? Let's just assume we ran box standard Rubocop. Uh, it does run command execute runner. Okay, so now let's look for run command, which is here which is run on the environment, uh, which is defined here, right? So, okay, there's something called environment, and then we are doing run on it with execute runner, okay? Okay, wow, now we have another class to look at, which is called command. Okay, uh, command, remember here we are passing in self as well as execute, uh, execute runners, I think. So, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> another, another layer, right? Uh, based by command name. So, okay, class for uh, execute runner, I think, and then pass in the environment and call run on it, right? Uh, and the class for is this base by. <coughs> oh, wait, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, and 
Yeah, wow, interesting. So when the different uh, command classes here are instantiate, uh, instantiated the, because they inherit from this class, all of the subclasses go into a, I guess it's a class instance variable. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then it will search for that particular class. Okay, wow, it's gone quite a, a long way. But if you remember, so we find the class, we, uh, the class is like execute runner, and then we pass in the environment and call run on it. So let's go into execute runner. And wow, we've got another thing here, right? We, uh, we now call this runner here, and on the runner we will do run right, with paths. Uh, so again here, I, uh, I'll skip to the part that looks interesting, which is probably this one, inspect files. And in inspect files, uh, there's this thing called each inspected file. So again, uh, I mean, I'm going a bit fast, but of course, like, you'll be able to look at it yourself later. So hopefully it helps later on. Uh, on each inspected file, it's calling process file, right? Which then uh, starts to look interesting, right? Because we start to look at offenses. And in offenses, uh, there's, I guess, the cache that uh, Albert mentioned earlier. Um, but then there's also this do inspection loop if it's not cache, right? And inside here, we I will skip over this part. Uh, you get the process source, but I think this corresponds exactly to that process source that we saw earlier in the talk. And uh, we will then iterate until no changes. Uh, and I think it's in offenses by iteration. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the part where I realize I should have practiced this a bit more. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, inspect file. <laughs> Here it calls investigate on this team thing. Ah, so much happening, right? Uh, which is this mobilized team. And that is a cop team, right? So when you mobilize cops, it will return uh, a, uh, a an array of uh, I guess cop classes. And on the cop classes, it calls investigate. Hmm. I feel like oh no, sorry. It creates a cop team class, I guess, from those classes. <laughs> oh, okay, it's a, it's a lot of way to go. Uh, and then finally, we hit investigate, right? And in investigate, uh, round up relevant cops, the autocorrect, process errors. I think it's investigate partial. Uh, okay, so here we see finally phew, we made it to the commissioner, and the commissioner is where the code really starts to get. Okay, I say I shouldn't say really, but like that's like I guess the part that's most interesting because we talked about it earlier. So remember, I I said when you instantiate uh, commissioner, there's actually some meta programming that happens. And that is here. So it goes through a list of node types. And for each of the node types, it will try to define an on node type method. 
and you see this uh, maybe I need to zoom out a bit you see that uh, depending on certain like flags that you you pass to it right or not flags sorry but, like depending on certain like conditions it will create a method with one or more of all of these right so here's the super that I talked about and you can see here these are the trigger responding and trigger restricted cops so we, we ignore the super for a while first uh, but here you can see okay I didn't really fully grok like this callback bit but you can see here that it, it comes out as a iterator of cops so I assume that it's passing a, a, a set of cops right and then there's this with error handling and here is where the public send to the the visitor happens um, so if the method doesn't exist then there's an error handling to catch uh, that method right. so that's like the that's a very long-winded way of answering your question about the, the, the method catching. I hope it was fun though. Um, but it's not, we're not done because this interesting super method, right? So what, what confused me a while because I always thought super has to be on an uh, inherited class. Uh, but you'll notice that there's no uh, parent class for this. So did you know and I did not know that super will call methods on included modules. Yeah, some of you knew, and not, but not me, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, so that's not here, right? So I said earlier that this is a different library, right? So we need to open that up and look for a traversal class. Oh, solar graph, I'm sorry. So here we have the traversal class, and uh, again, some magical meta programming is happening, uh, but in a very different way. Um, there's this like define callback, and then it basically does the method definition, and you see at the bottom of the class there's a whole list of define callbacks. So, <laughs> yeah, Rubocop. Um, so we'll go to the one that was more interesting which is this walk method right which if I remember correctly if we go back to the commissioner class uh, oh it's not here oh here in investigate uh, okay so I think I got my ordering a bit wrong but <laughs> uh, investigate will call walk which is on this AST and walk will send the method name which was defined here via the uh, meta programming and that will then trigger the cops as well as call super right so super goes back to the AST and uh, you see here like depending on the callback uh, there's a certain like body that gets executed so I think the one that's interesting is those that have children nodes like for example send so you see here the body is like okay for each of the children do the send code so the that's where the traversal happens and uh, yeah I guess that's like a, a quick view at how Rubocop implements it we can debate whether it's a very good design but uh, it's very interesting I think it's quite I, uh, I had never seen so much meta programming in my life until, <laughs> until this but yeah fun yeah um if any more questions if not yeah i guess that's that's all cool thank you thank you everyone thank you yeah.